Okay, <laughs> thank you. Well, welcome again this morning, and uh, uh, if this just falls off, I'm just going to leave it falling off. Glasses don't work well at the same time. I get the, uh, the privilege to speak to you this morning uh, just about uh, something that's um, a real familiar passage of Scripture, and uh, I want to share some thoughts uh, with you just regarding uh, probably one of the most uh, quoted verses in the Scriptures. Because of that, I uh, went back and just kind of read through some things, and uh, so I want to share with you uh, just some thoughts regarding uh, this passage. In 2015, in the year 2015, 160 million people visited the Bible Resource website called Bible Gateway. You may be familiar with it, uh, but it's a common Bible resource that people go to a lot. So out of 160 million people, uh, they conducted a research study from those visits in 2015 of the top five most popular Bible verses. And this passage that we're going to study today is on that list of the top five. So it's probably very familiar to you when we go over it. The number one visited reference. Anybody want to take a guess? John 3.16. Number one. Okay, and you know John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Number two on that list of the top five, Jeremiah 29.11. It's an Old Testament passage, and uh, that passage uh, you are familiar with as well. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Jeremiah 29, 11. Number three, Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And then number five, because what I'm going to cover is number four. So I'm going to skip number five on that list. It's Psalm 23, 4. Psalm 23, 4. Even though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That was the top five minus one at this point. Uh, of the 2015 most ref uh, referenced verse uh, from uh, that particular website, number four on that list was Romans 8.28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. Number four. I want to spend my time this morning sharing with you a very familiar passage uh, and maybe can bring some... Uh, different perspective, different insight uh, to some things. And quite honestly, I'm just, I'm just going to confess to you, I had planned to go through verse uh, 28 and 29 today of Romans. I'm not going to make it, okay? Uh, when I got to Romans 8, 28, uh, the more I began working on things, the more questions came up, the more things I began to realize, study through and work through. And uh, so I had a choice. I could either go really, really long with two verses and try to get both of them in, or maybe go a shorter verse of one verse to where I don't feel like I was rushing the next verse. So that's what I decided to do. So we're going to have probably just be a little bit uh, shorter today, but that's okay. So I want to focus on Romans 8.28, and maybe at some other time, we'll look into Romans 8.29, kind of as the, uh, the sequel uh, to that. But really, you, you fully can't understand Romans 8.28 unless you understand your version, if you will, of uh, that's the content of Romans 8.28. So I'd like to read those two passages together, even though we're only going to cover verse 28 uh, this morning. But before we read, let's, uh, let's pray together. Father, we are grateful uh, any time that we get the opportunity to gather as a group of believers that, have, uh, that all share the bond of the blood of Christ and that we have been called into the kingdom through your work and through your grace. And we are uh, grateful any time we can open up the book and we can get to know you a little bit more. Uh, Father, what we uh, talk about today, uh, may it be um, ingrained in our thought process and our minds that will find its way into our lives and affect decisions we make, attitudes that we possess, the behaviors uh, that we go through every day. Father, help us to uh, understand the value of, uh, of what your word teaches us uh, in this passage. So uh, uh, guide our hearts and our minds. Uh, we depend on your spirit to guide us into all truth. And it's in Christ that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> all right, Romans 8, 28, 8 and verse 29. If you have a Bible... Uh, read with me through that passage, if you will. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose, 
For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Most people are very familiar with Romans 8, 28, but not a whole lot are familiar with verse 29. Uh, but with that being said, I want to spend our time on Romans 8, 28. And uh, the first thing in the passage I want to come across to you is um, talk about the goodness of God. It's obviously the main drive of that passage is the goodness of God. When it makes a statement there in the passage, all things work together for good. Now, that's a passage that really is, uh, people love to hear that. They love to hear the hope that's contained in those words. But in the reality of life, sometimes it gets questioned, doesn't it? All things work together for good. And it's hard as we go through the, uh, the nuts and bolts, the uh, difficulties that we face, the um, disillusionments that come our way. Um, we, we struggle. Now, what's good about that? What's good about that? But on our good days, on our good days, it's easy to say that, isn't it? Okay? So let me kind of work through this with you. I want to start at the very beginning. The first two words of that passage says, we know. We know. So number one, it's going to be the fact. There's a lot to be said even in, that, uh, in those two words in this regard. Number one, it's going to be the fact that we know. So there's, we, we can't be, we're not in the situation of being uninformed or unaware I mean, there's a certainty involved in just those two words. We know. And so to, to clarify just a little bit, there are actually two different words that's in the Scriptures for the word know. There's two different ones. And one of the meanings that could be um, on this particular word um, has the idea of a fullness of knowledge. There's another term that's also used for the word no in other scriptures that talk about it frequently suggests inception or progress in knowledge. So one is either you're starting and you're in a learning process, you're getting there. The other one is you have full knowledge. Well, guess which one this term is? Full knowledge. Okay? So when it says we know, it's a term that is trying to communicate to us there is nothing hidden and if we say we do not know, then we're really deceiving ourselves. Because everything about this verse, we should know, and we do know, the truth of what's going to be communicated here. So there's no way that we can be able to uh, walk away from this and say, I've, I didn't know anything about this. Okay? And, and I think it's interesting that Paul puts that right in the front, that we know certain things, and we know to the fullest extent we're not uninformed in this. John 8, 55, for instance, kind of clarifies the use of these two, uh, two terms. And uh, when he says, Jesus says, but you, but you have not known him. And that's the other term. But you have not known him. And the parenthetical is almost, you have not begun to know him. I know him perfectly or completely or entirely. Okay, so even that one verse, you have both terms that's being used there to, to help clarify. If I were to say to you that I do not know him perfectly, I would be a liar like you. He's talking to the Pharisees, okay? Not, not to, his, <laughs> to the believers there. I would be a liar like you, but I do know him perfectly and I keep his word. So the term is used here in Romans 8, 28 is speaking to the idea that when we know, we're talking about the fullness of knowledge. We know fully and completely. So what is it then that we do know? That's a... That's the question I want to bring forth. But before I do that, I want to take a look at the people that this is addressed to. And if you see the passage there, for those who love God. That's a really qualifying type of verse. For those who know God, those is in reference, obviously, to believers. It's a pronoun used for believers. This is not talking about those who have never put their faith and trust in the Lord, those who have no idea who God is, no relationship with the Savior. It's not talking about those. This is talking to believers who have a relationship with God, who understand the work of the gospel and what has been in, in, in their life. It's for those who love God. And as I was studying through this, it kind of struck in my, my mind here the process of who love God, because that is a, that's a qualifying verse there as well in, in, a, in a term. How do we love God? How do we see that? How does it manifest itself in our day-to-day -day lives in, in, uh, that we live? The term carries the idea of affectionate reverence, prompt obedience, and a grateful recognition of benefits that come to us by way of God's love to us. 
Okay? So those who love God, they understand what God is doing in their lives, and they are appreciative, and they recognize that. Okay? But there's a practical outworking as well about the evidence of those who love God, and it falls into these four, so I want to give you four references here. So what is the evidence of those who love God? Because if it does say, for those believers who love God, and that can be seen in the uh, four different ways here. One, there is the idea that love is connected, your love to God is connected to your obedience to God. Okay? Disobedience also reflects a level of where your love is for God. Listen to John chapter 14, verse 21. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, and keeps them, he it is who loves me. So guys, there is no disconnect here. There is no disconnect. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them. There is a level of obedience that's tied in to that way of reflecting your love toward God is to do the things he asks you to do. Simple as that. So our love for him has a level of obedience tied to it. Also another passage in the same idea about our love towards God, how that can be evidenced is in the commitment issue and commitment itself. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. There's a commitment issue that's tied into your love for God and how that can be seen is tied into what you are committed to. You're either committed to God or you're not. You can't be both ways. You can't be a neutral party in this. Okay? So there is a commitment level to the evidence of those who love God that is seen in their lives. A third reference is one of sacrifice. Love is tied into the idea through sacrifice as well. In Ephesians 5, 2, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So the passage is talking about this idea of um, for those who love God, you're going to see a level of obedience, you're going to see a level of commitment, you're going to see sacrifice that's going to be seen and evident in their life. And there's one more reference I want to bring to you with this idea of showing forth love for God. It's really his love for each other. Is love for each other, those who are in the family itself, okay? And in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. And that's not my word, okay? That's, that's, that's John, okay? That's John. I'm just, saying, I'm just saying what he said. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. Something is not matching up here. Something's not matching up. He is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he is, cannot see, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. So that's the, uh, the other fourth qualifying uh, idea about the love of God and being evidenced in, in uh, how we love him. It can be seen in those, uh, in those areas. Your obedience, your commitment, your sacrifice, and our love for each other. And I think that's what Paul is talking about in Romans 8, 28. For those... Who love God. And that's what this promise in 828 is talking about. For those who spend their time valuably investing their time in these areas is who he's talking to. So that's the people involved in Romans 828. Okay? Now I want to go on down to that same verse and break down another portion of the passage to you because he speaks of a process that occurs as well. When he says, All things work together for good, all things work together. I've seen uh, signs up on, you know, a uh, process. Oftentimes you can go into, um, uh, I've seen uh, signs up on, you know, uh, uh, weight rooms in high schools. I've seen them in health, um, uh, health clubs and wherever else. You'll see a sign periodically that says, trust the process. Trust the process. I don't know if you've seen that or not. Um, but the fact is you may not see the end goal, but just trust the process that it's going to get you there. And you just continue working your way through. you got to trust the process. And um, believe that to be a true case uh, in, in this passage as well. So he talks about the process. So, so for those who love God, we know 
that for those who love God, all things work together for good. I don't know how else to break this thing down other than just to take them basically a phrase at a time in this passage because each of them really has a lot that is going to communicate to us. So let's talk about the all things idea, first of all, because this is kind of difficult as well. All things work together. Not certain things, not some things, but all things work together. It's used without what we call a definite article. It doesn't have one there. If you have a definite article in the text, what you're saying is you're, you're singling out one particular thing that you want to focus on. There is no definite article in the text, which means there's no specific thing, but it's everything. It's everything. Every kind or variety, and it's used in the inclusive sense. Nothing is left out of this term. It's really important to understand that. Nothing is left out of this term when he says all things. So what that means is everything that we would understand to be good and everything that we would think to be bad are included in the idea that all things, okay? And we as believers sometimes, we tend to categorize things when it comes to how we want to view things. But the truth of the matter is there's nothing left out. Everything that happens, every event that occurs happens within the concept, this whole idea of being all things. It's a very inclusive statement that leaves nothing out. And he goes on to say that all things, what do they do? All of these things, they work together. That is, um, uh, it's a systematic process that, uh, that begins to go on in our lives systematically, okay? And I know that you, you know, this goes back to the first two words, we know. God does certain things that we never see him involved in. We can't see the activity going on, but we know that he's working these things out. There is a process to everything that goes on. The problem is you and I can't see it. We can't see it. So we draw faulty conclusions about certain things because we don't know the details of what's happening. Well, you know, last time I read and looked into, that's what faith and trust is all about, isn't it? And we shouldn't draw conclusions about things if we don't know the end result yet and what it's going to look like. So there is a working together process. The idea is that God causes all things to work together for our good. Okay? They don't randomly just fall together. They don't circumstantially just happen to go by the wayside and see somebody there or something occurs. You're thinking, what is that all about? And I know that's happened to you before. You know, you run into somebody you haven't seen in 30 years at a Burger King somewhere in the interstate on vacation. You think, that was kind of random. Really? Maybe? Maybe it's not random. If God is sovereign in all things, then nothing happens by accident. Nothing happens unplanned. So the idea is that, the, that God causes all things to work together. Involvement in the present, by the way, for our good. Because of that, God's involvement in the presence, excuse me, without God's involvement in the process, then there is no guarantee that for our good will ever occur. Okay, do you understand that? If God is not directly involved in the process, then there is no guarantee that what's going to happen is going to be for our good. He has to be involved. He has to be involved in all things. So it is God's direct involvement in this working together process that guarantees the result of our good in any situation. So that's why he makes the statement, all things that might occur in your life, good, bad, hard, difficult, all things that occur in your life and in my life are going to be considered to be good because he's going to guarantee that because God is directly involved in that. It dawned on me several years ago, I guess maybe five, six years ago, my wife and I sold our house. And uh, it was a very frustrating process for us because it was also, if you remember that time, the housing market just bottomed out. And it was a buyer's market. It was not a seller's market. And we had uh, tried for three years to sell our house. And we would get frustrated. We'd take over the market. We'd do certain things. We'd try to fix something. We'd try to make it more eye appealing, curb appeal, all the real estate stuff you can think of out there. We tried it all, and we could not sell our house. Now, I do know there's a financial issue as well involved in that. But one day it dawned on me 
because I see the all things issue during this time, I was realizing I just have myself in this picture. I'm only thinking about myself in this. And as I was mowing the lawn, I was literally mowing the lawn when this happened, I remember distinctly, it dawned on me that somebody's got to buy this house. And for somebody to buy this house, that means they're part of the thread of all things that maybe they have to sell a home or a job transfer or something before they can get to my house. There's a lot of things that's got to happen in their house or in their situation before they can ever get to where God wants them for me. Because I, I, I'm just going to put it out there, guys. I believe in the sovereignty of God, that he can, conducts all things according to his good will and his good time and his sovereign will. And so I'm, I'm realizing whoever God has set for this house, he's got to work in their life as well on their time frame. And here I'm sitting there complaining and moaning and groaning about things and come to realize I've got to wait until God works in someone else's life before he can put them in my house. But we always just focus on ourselves, don't we? We always think, why is God running late? Why isn't he doing something right now? I mean, after all, you know, I've, uh, we've been here for three years trying to sell this thing. And then I realized, indeed, if he is sovereign, all things work together. He's created this fabric on his own time and the way that he is, is going to put this thing together. And uh, guess what happened shortly thereafter is we sold the house. Whoever it was that God had ordained to be in my house when we sold it, he finished up all his work he was doing in that person, that family's life, to bring them there. And then we were able to move on to something else. And it kind of dawns on me. But we do tend to individualize our own situations when it comes to things like this. And we tend to forget that God is working behind the scenes. And there's a lot of things that go on that we never see, we never consider. And thus we get a little bit angry at God. We get impatient with God. We want to, you know, lash out at God and, and demand that he, uh, you know, be a little bit more sensitive to our time frame. Well, all things work together. All things work together for good. And here comes the kind of the tough part here, guys. When he says that for good, that's where it gets kind of a little more difficult. It describes that uh, which being good is in its character or its nature and is beneficial in its effect and to our advantage. If he says all things work together for good, then whatever it is, is indeed going to be good. But it's hard for us to get this sense of understanding because we look at things and say, that is not good. That's not good. I'm going to do that just a, just a little bit later on to kind of clarify that. But God is essentially good. One thing I want you to understand is that God is essentially, absolutely, and constantly good. He is a good God. In his existence, it's part of his character, part of his nature. It's really important to understand and to grab a hold of that. In every situation you come across, you must remember God is always good. It's declared in Scripture. He's always good. Let me give you some verses just to kind of let you know what this is. In Matthew 19, 17, and he said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. There's only one who is good. If you would enter life, how do you call me? Keep the commandments. Mark 10, verse 18, and Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. James 1.17, a little bit of a different passage, but I'll make a connection for you here. In James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. So what the connection between those three verses? The first two are talking about that God is good and no one else is. God is good at everything he does. If you remember even back in Genesis chapter 1 and the creation process, what did God declare after every part of his creation, day 1, day 2, day 3, day 4, what did he declare about all of those things? It is good, right? Let there be light, and it was good. And he created the firmament and the seas and the, and the expanse and all those, and he declared it was good. And at the end of it all, when he kind of steps back and looks around at the whole scope of things, he said, it is very good. That's an important connection because I want you to understand that whatever God does by way of his character, if his character is good, then what he does must also be good. There can be no disconnect there. 
God is not going to, a good God is not going to do something bad and evil. He is driven by his own characteristic of his goodness. So everything he does is good. So some, some of the things that we misunderstand is not on the side of God. Perhaps it's on the side of our inability to understand. Maybe that's where it is. Every good and perfect gift is from above. And everything he does is good because he himself is good. And since God is fundamentally good in his character and nature, then it follows that everything he does will be good. Our disbelief or doubts in this process is in our inability to see the good of what we call bad things. What we call bad things. We have a comprehension problem. That's what it is. Because if God has already declared all things work together for good, who are we to question that and say, no, that wasn't good, God. When God's already made the declaration, I'm not going to wag my finger in his face and say, no, 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 you got that one wrong. This one didn't go well. This was not good. But this one is. But this was not. When God says, uh, all things, all things work together for good. Maybe we need to be reminded of the passage in Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, another fairly popular verse, but didn't make the top five list in 2015. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Maybe we need to be reminded of that. When the tendency is to look at something, draw a judgment on God, and a slight accusation tone in our voice to saying, why God, this is not a good deal. How can you say such a thing in Romans 8, 28? And maybe God says, you know what? You just don't see it from my side of it. Trust me. My ways are not your ways. And my thoughts are are not your thoughts. There is a level there that we have to understand that God is in control and knows what goes on and we cannot see. We cannot see things. For instance, an illustration in 1665. 1665, the residents of London, England were dying by the... 1665, right at the time frame of medieval Europe, okay? Thousands were dying each day. The bubonic plague was spreading from house to house because of the unsanitary conditions. Rats and fleas spread the germs throughout the city, and almost 30,000 people died. Almost a third of London's population at that time. 30,000 people died. In fact, the nursery rhyme that we all sang supposedly, you know, comes from that, which I actually find it did not, uh, you know, ring around the rosy, pocket full of posies, tissue, tissue, you all fall down. I actually did not come from that, but that's a common belief of that. So I was a little disappointed to find that out, actually. But uh, so when you sing that little song, it's, um, it's not really related to that event. But nonetheless, um, It was called the Black Death during that time. This plague was so bad that experts surmise that the entire population of London would have died if it had not been checked. Now, this is 1665 when there weren't really a lot of medical um, discoveries during that time, very limited of what they could do. But on September 2nd in 1666, about a year later, the Great Fire of London broke out. Most people are going to think, Wow, London goes from one huge disaster right into another huge disaster. God, what about that? What about that? I mean, not only are 30,000 people dead and gone now, now everything's burned to the ground. How in the world can that be seen as something good? The Great Fire of London broke out and burned uncontrollably for five years days. Most of the structures in medieval London were wooden, and almost the entire city was reduced to ashes. But when the fire finally died, the epidemic of the Black Death was halted. The fire cleaned the city of the impurity that was killing the people. 
the rats, the fleas, all that death, all that disease that was rampant, then the great fire of London killed it all. And people were able to get back to their lives. Was it a disaster? Absolutely it was. There's no one in their right mind that would look at both events from our side of it and say, those are not good things to happen in someone's life. Yet had the great fire not happened, there would have been much greater damage and probably spread through Europe at large and affected the entire continent of Europe. So we have to be careful because of our limited insight and our limited vision on this side of things to accuse God and say, how dare he even think that something like this is good in my life? We simply do not know. And let be patient and let the outcome and the trust and the faith in God work through the process. Work all things together for good. So we have to be careful about uh, pulling, you know, uh, the trigger a little too quickly on God. Well, we see that the people involved are those who love God. The process is that all things are working together. And then there's the purpose at the very bottom of this thing. There's a purpose behind it. And what you and I, this is what we normally miss because we have limited vision and we don't quite understand a few things. But for those who are called according to his purpose, all things work together for good to them that love God and those who are called according to his purpose. So what is that purpose? Well, that's in verse 29. We'll have to cover that at a later time, but I'm going to mention it here. But the, for those who are called is also in reference to the believers that was already mentioned in the first part of verse 28. Those who are called. To call anyone, it means to invite, to summon. And in the New Testament epistles, this call is God's effectual calling of his elect that brings them to salvation. They are believers in Christ. They have been called by God into the kingdom. And for those who are called according to his purpose. The idea of according to his purpose is kind of an interesting term. It means a setting forth, a setting forth. And it was actually used in the Old Testament on the table. And get this, the table of showbread. You remember that term? Have you ever heard that? In the tabernacle, in the temple, one of the tables in the first part of the sanctuary was called the table of showbread. I always wonder why it was called the table of showbread. It never made any sense to me until I began doing some work on this. And it was the same term, same idea. That, well, that's what a table of showbread does. You're showing your bread. Oh, wow, that's brilliant, you know. That's brilliant. But it's the same idea. It's making something, bringing it into view. So whatever the purpose is, whatever the purpose is, for those who are called according to his purpose, it's not a purpose that's hidden. It's not a purpose that you can't see. But haven't we already said that a lot of times we draw conclusions on God because we can't see the end result of a working process? So there's got to be something that's visible in this whole idea about what it is that's good. So the purpose is not hidden from us. Can I propose to you that if we don't see the purpose, perhaps we're looking in the wrong place? Is that a possibility? Is that even a probability? More than likely it is. Because the term says it's the purpose that's viewable right there in front of us. We can see it. And if we don't see it, then we're not looking in the right direction. So what is the purpose in view? Well, I will go into verse 29 at this point because if I didn't, it would leave too much of a question. The purpose in view in verse 29 is to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the bottom line. The purpose that we all know and that's in view is that God works all things together for good. What is the good is that we are being conformed to the image of Christ. That's what's good. That's what makes difficult circumstances that we think are ugly bearable because we see what that's going to do for us. That's a visible thing. That's where God has let us know what the purpose is. So, in a summary of the passage, God has ordained that every believer will be conformed to the image of his son. 
Absolutely. Conform to the image of his son. It is something that God has set forth in every believer. That's in verse 29, so I'm not going to go into a whole lot of that and try to explain that. I'll run out of time. But just know that those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the purpose. That's why he works all things together in the life of a believer. Because you know what's happening to you and I, even as we sit here, even tomorrow when you go to your workplaces, you know what's happening right now? You are being conformed to the image of his son. What greater good is there than that? Verse 28 is the instructions as to how that will happen. The good that is referenced is that God will use every circumstance, whether easy or difficult, disappointing or successful, whether in the crushing of dreams or the reaching of goals, in the negative or the positive, God is using every circumstance to conform us to the image of a son. We can't see it. We can't feel it. Nor are we are even aware of the process that is going on. But a good God is orchestrating all things behind the scenes for our good to be conformed to the image of his son and through that for his glory. If God is not sovereign, then the promise that verse 28 speaks of becomes a lie. If God is not sovereign, because sovereignty is the idea of the governing and controlling of all things, such a state. And if God couldn't do that, then how could the scriptures make such a statement that everything that happens to us is for our own good? How can he make that statement if he can't make it happen? One thing that's out of the control of God ruins the entire verse, ruins, ruins all of scripture, ruins God's own integrity as God himself. He has to be true. He has to be. He has to control all situations. And so what we tend to do and what I tend to do is that whatever situation I might be in, good or bad, and use this the bad side of things that I'm in, I tend to focus on why did that person do that to me? Why did they say this about me? Why did this change? And our total focus comes on the individuals that have offended us, that have hurt us, that have created some level of harm in our lives. And we're looking for answers in that situation. You know what? We can't find them. What we find is bitterness and anger and frustration. And we get no answers. We get no answers. When the whole time God is saying, I'm going to use this situation. Did it hurt? Absolutely it did. Does it hurt for a while? Probably will. But I'm going to use this to a greater good in your life. And that means because I know who you are, you're going to be like my son. And maybe God needs to remind us at times what's better than that. And so our focus is in the wrong direction in a lot of our lives. When things come our way that are unsettling, that disrupt our lives, that disrupt our routines, and we get angry at God, and we question, really? It's for my good? I mean, I didn't get my raise at work. I didn't get my day off at work. I didn't get my vacation time at work. How is that, how is that not good? And God says, you're missing the point. The goodness is found in the conformity to my son, which makes everything else that's difficult bearable because we're seeing it from the right perspective. So go back to, uh, to read verse 28 again. I can find page one. All things work together for good to those that love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And his purpose is that we be like his son. That's verse 28. I think we need some work in verse 29 at a later time, perhaps, to uh, see the real issues of how that's going to happen.
because God is making that process occur even as we are here today. Well, as we prepare for uh, communion, and, and Chuck and Angie could ask you all, if you don't mind, to uh, come forward and help us in that area. But just a couple of thoughts in regards to what we're uh, talking about here this morning. Communion, as we prepare to take it this morning, maybe consider this, that God knew the good that would come forth to mankind from the most appalling death that has ever occurred in history. His own son. There was a purpose in that sacrifice. Because of that death, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. And we will be like the one who sacrificed himself on our behalf. And folks, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So as we stand, I'd like for you just to consider maybe something in the passage here. The verse is true. If you doubt it, the verse is true. All things, and we know this, all things work together for good to those that love the Lord, to those who are called according to his purpose. So as we spend just a few minutes just before I ask you to come down and, and take part of communion, if you'd, li- if you'd like to, if you are a believer in Christ, grab a hold of this verse and understand that this is a truth that God has given us to hold on to. And the real issue is that we are being conformed to his son. And let's not get so burdened down, so frustrated with down here where life can get really dirty sometimes. And we need to see from a bird's eye view up top. If you're not a believer in Christ, maybe these words will be an encouragement to you. If my life is just tough and that's all I see, is there anything outside of this? Do I have to bear these disappointments alone? This hurt alone? You don't. You don't. Christ is there. He has paid a price. The greatest good that could ever occur came through his death on the cross. And that's what we celebrate his body. We're paying the penalty that you and I should have paid, that God required of us, until Jesus says, I'll do it, because they can't. The gospel in a very simple way is, I can't, he can. As simple as it gets. If you don't know him, we'd invite you to do that. And when you take the wine, please remember uh, as well the blood of Christ. Not only is there death involved, but there's life in the blood of Christ. There's life in the blood. So as you take that cup, remember the life that is extended to you as well in him. So let's pray, and as you do, then you may come forward. Father, we thank you for this time. Forgive us for when we moan and groan and we get wrapped up so much in our own uh, issues that we fail to see that you are working, all things working together. And it's for your glory. We're really not the primary issue here. It's whatever you choose to do in our lives to conform us to the image of Christ is going to bring glory to you. That's what the real issue is. Forgive us for we get so wrapped up in our own selves and our own situations, and our anger that's come to you a lot of times because we see a verse like this, and it doesn't seem it's going our way, and we miss the point. The point is, you're going to use that to make us like your son. Sometimes that's difficult, and sometimes it's fun. Sometimes it's a good. It's good things that, that occur in our lives that you bring about because every good and perfect gift comes from you. So, Father, bless our time together as we come forward to take communion, to remember the things that you've done for us. Help us to worship in a way that's uh, worthy of the calling that you've placed in our lives. In Christ, let me pray. Amen. Come.